There we go. Right, okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the military threat to the climate. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'll start with a little bit about our organisation. If you haven't come across this before, Scientists for Global Responsibility, we're a UK based research and advocacy organisation with several hundred members who are scientists and engineers um, right across the disciplines. Um, and we work on a range of issues, climate change, nuclear weapons among them, militarism in science and technology. And we've done a lot of work recently on military carbon emissions. And um, we published several reports recently on both the climate and environmental threats from nuclear weapons and um, military carbon emissions um, at the UK, EU and global levels. So um, I'll be drawing on a lot of this information in the talk, as well as um, various other bits and pieces of research. Um, some of our work has been um, used um, most recently in this report, this parliamentary report by the House of Commons Defence Committee. Um, they published a report on defence and climate change in August, and they quoted us quite a lot, which was encouraging. Um, um, and yeah, some of our um, recommendations made it into this report, although um, unsurprisingly, not the more radical ones, which I will be focusing on tonight. So how do militaries and war fuel climate change? Um, well, basically, they emit a lot of carbon emissions because they consume a lot of energy. Um, part of the problem, though, is that they are not very good at reporting these emissions or have a lot of exemptions. Um, so, for example, um, emissions from military aviation and shipping in international areas don't have to be reported in, in um, the national reports that um, governments send to the to the United Nations climate body. Um, some of the categories that are used, um, for example, public buildings can include military bases. Um, so reporting can be hidden un under various um, rather more innocuous sounding categories. The arms industry is reported under industry for, as another example. Um, and then you've got the impacts of war um, or the destruction of, of ecosystems, of burning of cities, things like that. They they can appear in all sorts of other categories um, and things like land use change um, or, or the reconstruction um, post-war will just come under construction. So, um, so there are various different ways in which the, these emissions are hidden. Um, and if you look in the, the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the UN's um, climate science advisory body, um, you will barely find any mention of military emissions or, or war-related emissions, and you certainly won't find any numbers in there. Um, and this has been a long-term problem, and in fact it was the US government in 1997 which um, led efforts to conceal these emissions um, um, and uh, under the Kyoto Protocol they argued um, or they successfully argued that certain emissions didn't need to be included and certainly not covered by targets, um, reduction targets. So what does the um, what does the military carbon bootprint um, involve? Um, I've kind of hinted about a few of these things. Um, so at, at its core, you've got the military bases and the military equipment. So all the, all the planes, the ships, the tanks, the very energy intensive, very fuel intensive um, equipment. Um, there's the, the sort of routine military exercises and patrols. And then, of course, there's the, the higher impact war fighting capability. And then you've got military bases, sometimes um, that includes foreign bases, um, particularly if it's the US. Um, and then you've got lots of supply chains. So you've got the uh, the arms industry, the military technology industry, and all the raw materials that go into that. You've got suppliers of all the other things that armies use, uniforms, food, IT. Um, and then you've got the land it owns. Um, and, that, and those things together um, are on the left-hand side of, of the dotted line on this diagram. Um, they make up the military carbon footprint. Um, but if you include all the impacts of war fighting, then you get what we call the military carbon bootprint. 
um, and that's some of the things on the right hand side of the diagram. So it, it's it's the fires, it's it's the damage to ecosystems, it's um, the healthcare of, of um, dealing with the casualties, and reconstruction at the end of wars as well. Um, so there have been various estimates of carbon footprints, carbon footprints of militaries and wars um, um, in different parts of the world. Um, most of them, if not all of them, have been done by um, various NGOs like Scientists for Global Responsibility. Um, and I've got some of the latest data here published in, in a report, um, a couple of reports, one by the Transnational Institute um, and one by some independent researchers working with the Ukrainian um, government and research organizations. So um, the graph on the right shows estimates for the carbon footprint of NATO um, in the in the blue there, over 200 million um, tons of carbon emissions. So that includes um, all the fuel use, the military bases, the supply chains um, of all NATO countries. You can see on the, on the far right of the diagram, we've got the figures just for Europe and just for UK. Um, and you can see that's much smaller than NATO total because the US is so large, twice as much as the rest of NATO put together. Um, but the UK is the largest of the European countries in terms of its military carbon footprint. Um, and then in the middle of the graph, you've got uh, estimates for um, the Ukraine war, one year uh, of the Ukraine war. So you've got the war fighting impacts, the fuel use um, used by the military equipment, and also the impacts of things like fires, um, damage to ecosystems, um, damage to gas pipelines and leakages um, and, and things like refugee movements as well. And then in the orange, you've got reconstruction, which is an estimated amount of what would happen after the war um, when the buildings that have been destroyed um, would be um, reconstructed. So you can see that it, it amounts to hundreds of millions of tons, um, these, these sort of uh, figures. Um, and that doesn't include um, doesn't include all the impacts of war. And of course, this is these are figures for um, just a fraction of the world's militaries. Um, one of the disturbing um, statistics from the latest report is that the NATO's carbon footprint um, has gone up about fifteen percent in just two years because of the spending increases that we've been seeing, um, and partly as a result of the Ukraine war, but. Uh, but these um, military increases were already, um, military spending increases were already happening before then. Um, and then the final thing is just to reiterate, the uncertainties are high um, in this data. These are estimates based on, on some, um, some patchy data from a, a few of the world's militaries that do publish some data. Um, and one of the things we did in, in one of our reports was try and estimate a, um, a what the global military carbon footprint was. And we came up with a, a figure of um, our best estimate was about 2,700 um, million tons, 2,750 million tons, about 5.5% of the um, world's carbon emissions. And if it were a country, the world's militaries would be larger than Russia, larger than the whole of Russia and, and slightly smaller than the whole of India. Um, so it'd be the fourth largest country in the world. And you can see that in the graph um, at the bottom. Um, but as I say, a wide range of uncertainty. Um, and again, these are in, this is an incomplete estimate. This doesn't include war impacts. This is just about the military carbon footprint um, without the war impact. So it's fuel use, it's supply chains, um, it's military bases, but not the impacts of, of war fighting itself. Um, and and <clears throat> the other thing to remember about, particularly about large wars, is that they have an impact on the global economy, and they have the, the effects ripple out far beyond the countries involved. And so, the war in Ukraine had a major impact on, or is having a major impact on oil and gas prices, and that's led to various changes in in global CO two emissions beyond outside the war zone. So um, the graph um, on the right um, shows some of the effects of this. Th these are the changes in emissions um, between 2021 and 2022. Um, and 
not all of them are connected to the war, but at least a, a large fraction of these changes are connected to the war. So you've got things like with oil and gas prices going up, you've got more solar and, and wind power being installed and being used. And so you've got avoided emissions due to that. You've got industrial slowdown and, and decreased gas use. Um, but then you've also got some switching to coal use. So that's caused a large increase and some increase in oil use as well. So the overall change is, is um, over that year was about just over 300 million tonnes that were increased. Um, and a large fraction of that, we can't tell exactly how much, but a large fraction of that is due to the, um, due to the war. Um, but that's not the only impact on the global economy. There are other um, investment decisions that have been made, been made, and they're arguably even bigger. So you've got things like um, investments in new oil and gas fields. So we've seen um, what's happening in the UK with the announcement of the Rosebank oil fields and other oil fields, the new Cumbrian coal mine. Um, the biggest impact has been on, on gas use and supply of gas, and particularly in the US, um, supply of what, what's called LNG, which is liquefied natural gas. So this is gas that is transported by ship, not by pipeline. In order to um, make it manageable, um, the gas is compressed and liquefied um, so that it can be put into containers and, and then transported by ship. This is energy intensive to do, so the gas is much higher carbon than just burning it. Um, and um, as you can see from the graph here, the, the extra infrastructure allows extra exploitation um, and extra um, use of this gas around the world. And that could add another um, couple of um, or, or around 200 million tons, 2,000 million tons, 1.9 million tons extra if, if the global, um, if the, the proposed extra infrastructure is all um, brought into practice. Um, and that, that would be an incredible, um, incredibly damaging thing. And that, that um, there's a comparison there with the orange line um, of where the scenario should be if we were seriously heading to net zero. And if we build all this infrastructure, um, um, it would be uh, far and away beyond um, any net zero um, scenario. Um, so that's the carbon emissions. Then there's also the impacts. Should anything turn nuclear, any, any conflict turn nuclear, you could get a whole load of different um, impacts on the climate. Um, the biggest issue is the threat of nuclear winter. This was um, first um, first um, understood by scientists in the 1980s, um, and it was one of the um, pieces of research that helped lead to the major nuclear disarmament at the end of the Cold War. So what happens in a nuclear winter? You start off with the nuclear explosions, they lead to firestorms. So very intense fires um, when you get um, quite a few nuclear explosions together. Um, this leads to plumes of smoke that are, are very energy, um, have loads of energy in it, and, and they are pumped into the upper atmosphere. So that's above the clouds, above the brain level, um, so they're not rained out. Um, and they, they, these clouds start to spread out in the upper atmosphere, and then they block out the sun's rays. Um, and that leads to major temperature drops. Plants die, animals die, humans die. Um, the impacts are massive. Um, to show you in a bit more detail about how the temperature changes work, this is a, a graph of um, temperature change across the globe. Um, the blue line is the increase in temperature change, uh, increasing in global temperature over the, um, over the last 100 years or so um, due to increasing carbon emissions. And then the, the three ticks at the end are the catastrophic change in temperature should there be a, a nuclear war. So you've got the, the smaller scenario is the regional nuclear war. Then you've got the, the green. In green, you've got a, a small global nuclear war and then a, 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 a major or, or an even larger um, nuclear war. Um, and th this estimate was done in 2007 when there are more nuclear weapons in the world. So it's got a higher estimate um, for, the, for the changes, but nuclear weapons numbers are now rising again. So we could return to that potential scenario. Um, 
And what you see in, in the graph, let, let's look at the red line, which is a regional nuclear war, say, between India and Pakistan, or which could be brought about by um, the UK arsenal. In, indeed, um, the, the nuclear weapons on one Trident submarine could be enough to bring them out bring about a scenario of this sort of scale. And so what you've got um, is a rapid reduction in the first two years of, of um, global temperatures. Um, and in this scenario, it's a, a drop of about 1.5 degrees over a couple of years. And that's the sort of scale of temperature change that we're worried about in the opposite direction for climate change, um, except that would take place over decades to centuries, whereas um, here, this is taking place just over two years. So you can imagine the catastrophic change, the inability of ecosystems to adapt, the inability of human si systems to adapt um, to changes in that scale. And then you get a bounce back. But the bounce back would be even worse than the original warming cycle because you burnt all the buildings and ecosystems and the nuclear war, and that's added to the carbon emissions. And, and because carbon is a long lived greenhouse gas, um, you take that warming, and, and that warming would be accelerated as, as the cooling period ends, as the smoke slowly starts to clear. Um, so the, the, the effects are, are really quite catastrophic. Um, and, and you can see um, in the green and the brown, you've got steadily larger um, transitions. And, and in the brown, it's larger than going into an ice age. Um, so it, it's that sort of scale of, of global transition. Um, and to show you in another way, here's a map of um, one of the high um, nuclear war scenarios. Um, so this is this is cooling during the first year um, after a um, after a nuclear weapon, a nuclear war, um, and these are summertime temperatures, summertime temperature change. So you see temperature drops there of, of minus 30, minus 35 degrees in the summer. So that have a, have a catastrophic effect on, on food growing um, and lead to um, massive, massive numbers of people starving. So, but it's all right because the military are interested and serious, honest about going green. Um, and they have a, a, a th their approach here, there are, there are strategies being put together by the UK Ministry of Defence, the US, um, various European governments, NATO. Um, and I've got some quotes here from the UK um, um, document. And they say they seek to use the green transition to add to our military capabilities. And we're going to fight and win in ever more hostile and unforgiving environments. So that that's the aim of it. It's to try and use greener technologies to add to their war fighting abilities um the the americans are, are more direct the the report um i've shown the cover of it in the corner more fight less fuel um it gives you an idea of this is what the military strategies are so their attempts to reduce carbon emissions are very much focused around some of the most controversial technologies so for example using more biofuels in um planes and ships um, and biofuels, um, a lot of biofuels, particularly the ones that, that um, are, are most commonly available, growing from energy crops, and energy crops compete um, with land for food crops. So that's a really bad idea to, to expand that option. Um, another option is synthetic fuels. Um, but these are these are barely out of the lab at the moment, and they are very energy intensive and economically expensive to, to um, produce. Um, so they won't be around in, in, in large amounts for a long time, for, for decades. Um, another option is to go for more drones because they're smaller and lighter. But then that raises um, the prospect of an acceleration to um, uh, um, artificial intelligence based war, robotic warfare, use of autonomous weapons and all the risks that come with that. Um, then you've got um, more use of nuclear power in warships warships and um in remote bases and all the risks that go with that and then you've got the other one the fallback is, is offsetting so more trees on military land in the hope that those trees won't die due to climate change um so I and mean, the one thing they're not talking about is changing security strategies changing military strategies and trying to um find ways of, of dealing with conflict without resorting to pointing weapons at each other 
and they're certainly not talking about the climate threat from nuclear weapons. And um, there's an unspoken strategy with the, this sort of continued focus on militaries, and, and that is um, in which militaries help richer countries and richer sections of society maintain their access to fossil fuels and, and other resources. Um, so I've got two examples here. One is um, a Greenpeace report which came out um, a couple of years ago that looked at EU um, funded military missions. Um, and they found that two thirds of them were um, related to making sure that fossil fuel transportation from the Persian Gulf to Europe would, was maintained in a in smooth and predictable fashion. Um, the other element on, on the right is draft um, we've got of um, the inequality in emissions in the world. So the richest 10% of the world are responsible for nearly half of the world's carbon emissions. Um, and this graph is known as the champagne glass graph, and you can see why. Um, and it shows the gross inequality. And th this sort of inequality, unequal global system of consumption um, is what is maintained or helped to be maintained by, by having um, strong militaries um, in richer countries. Um, and you'll notice that, that during the Ukraine war last year, um, when we were talking about looking at ways to um, try and curb gas use, no one suggested that richer people should be curbing their gas use much more than poorer people. That was never mentioned. And yet this is what is, is maintained by this um, unfair system. So what about spending? Um, this is these this graph is of government military spending around the world um, on um, global military spending um, on on the left hand side of the graph compared with global climate spending by governments and and you can see a gross indifference there. Global military spending is now over two point two trillion dollars a year, um, and the um, bar in the middle is the estimate of the shortfall in spending on tackling climate change if we're serious about hitting the 1.5 degree um, temperature target and you can see that a shift from military spending to climate spending would um, go a long way to um, meeting filling that shortfall so we need to change course unsurprisingly um, and the missing strategy is demilitarization for decarbonization um, we need to focus much more on diplomacy and, and finding ways to build trust internationally to diffuse conflict without putting more and more weapons at each other, engaging in arms races, which turn into wars. Um, we need to use arms control treaties and disarmament treaties. Um, and these are being dismantled at the moment. This is exactly, it's going in exactly the reverse direction um, because of all the problems related to the Ukraine war. Um, we need to redirect a large fraction of military spending to just transition. So we need to get rid of targets like the NATO's 2% um, GDP spending target. Um, and we need to shift that money into low carbon industries so that we can rapidly expand them or expand them even faster. Um, and so um, move to a much lower carbon economy. We need a rapid phase out of nuclear weapons and we need a shift from from governments focused on national security to focusing on human security. So a much broader um, effort to tackle problems of poverty and inequality and injustice um, and threats from, from climate change and, and lack of food. Um, and there's the UN security, um, UN definition of human security there, that three types, freedom, freedom for fear, fear, freedom from want, freedom from indignity. Um, and there's a, a lot more um, that the UN has written on this issue and, and where we need to prioritise resources to tackle it. And the good news is that past demilitarization efforts have resulted in large falls in, in military carbon emissions. So at the end of the Cold War, there is some data from the US and the UK in, in this period, and, and it shows that the US Armed Forces emissions fell by 44% in 10 years after the end of the Cold War, and um, UK Air Force and Navy emissions that fell by about a third. Um, and we think that the falls in the former Soviet Union countries in Eastern Europe were, were much larger, but the data doesn't exist for that period. So um, we can only, only estimate, guesstimate really. 
Um, so to finish campaign goals for the military and climate, um, firstly, we need robust, transparent reporting on all military carbon emissions. So those data gaps that I talked about at the beginning and, and the, the estimates that we're coming up with, we need much better reporting so we can actually control these emissions. We, so we have accurate estimates as we do in, in a lot of other areas we have much more accurate estimates of military carbon emissions, and then we can track how, how they're being reduced. And then we need all, all military activities to be covered by the same climate targets as all the other sectors um, and, and pushing towards 1.5 degrees, although I'm very aware that 1.5 degrees is virtually out of reach now, but we still need to try and keep as close as we can to that. Um, and then we need demilitarization as part of the shifts. Um, as part of this shift and a move towards human security priorities um, and nuclear weapons abolition, um, obviously. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'll put these slides on our website, so if you want to look um, in more detail, you can do.